name is Gronia Scheel. I'm a physio in St. James's Hospital and also a research fellow in the Trinity Exercise Oncology Group. I am delighted to present today on the role of physical activity in advanced cancer and, and just want to say thank you for the invitation to present on this topic. And this is an important area because of the large number of patients we see presenting with stage um, four or advanced or metastatic cancer. Um, and in the past, those patients may have been given a guarded prognosis, but now as patients live for longer periods on treatment, they experience the side effects of both their cancer and their cancer treatment for longer periods as well. And we know now that a lot of these side effects um, are amenable to physical activity interventions. So we need to, I suppose, know how to prescribe activity um, and exercise that will help patients to maintain their physical activity um, levels um, and to limit the side effects of their cancer and their cancer treatment. So to give us an idea of the patients that we're talking about, we have um, statistics here from the National Cancer Registry. And why these statistics are a little bit old now, they do give an idea of the amount of patients who are living with advanced cancer and who may benefit from physical activity interventions. It also gives an idea of the amount of patients who are quite young who are living with advanced cancer and again who may live with cancer for a considerable amount of time. Um, and we know that patients are interested in participating in exercise programmes. Um, Cross-sectional studies have identified up to 90% of patients are interested in participating in physical activity programmes but we know that less than 30% of these patients that are living with advanced cancer will actually achieve the um, physical activity guidelines um, for cancer patients. So it's important that we look at the interventions we can provide to patients. If we take just one subgroup of patients with advanced cancer, so those who have bone metastases, and look at the impact of um, their diagnosis on their physical health, we can see a number of areas that um, they will experience deficits in. One is muscle weakness. Um, so we know that skeletal muscle loss and muscle weakness um, are a well-described consequence of early stage cancer. And it's also the case for advanced cancer. And this is important because sarcopenia is associated with treatment toxicity, and it's also related to time to tumor progression. So if we can put in interventions to limit this, um, they could have profound effects. So patients with bone metastases have participated in studies where we've seen that um, muscle weakness is evident. They do sit to stand, so number of sit to stands that are that's timed in 30 seconds. Um, and these patients achieve about half of what healthy ma matched controls will achieve. So in one study, patients averaged 11 sit to stands in 30 seconds. And we know that healthy um, controls will get over 15 sit to stands in 30 seconds. And it's important because, because less than 15 um, sit to stands um, in 30 seconds is predictor, a predictor of falls risk and fracture risk. Um, so we need to pay attention to that, particularly in a group of compromised bone health, um, like patients with bone mets. We also see lower levels of physical functioning, and that can be measured in a lot of different ways. Um, and one way is a, sit, uh, a six minute walk test. So how far a patient can walk in six minutes. Um, and we know that patients with metastatic disease have um, participated in these studies. One in particular where patients had advanced lung cancer, patients who got less than 358 meters in their six minutes did have a greater chance of all cause mortality when they were compared with patients who achieved more than 385 meters in their six minutes. So again, indicators here that patients not only are, are experiencing physical deficits, but those deficits are, are related to um, important outcomes. Also, we have, I suppose, physical activity, um, and that is very important also. We have objective markers of physical activity now, and um, things like actigraphs that can um, objectively measure patients' activity over long periods of time. And we know those scores correlate significantly with the patient's uh, quality of life. So again, 
important indicators that there are areas um, that may benefit from interventions and patients may experience positive outcomes because of the interventions. What we're trying to do is balance up the disease and treatment related side effects that the patient is experiencing with the rehabilitation and activity that we provide. So while we know that there's muscle impairment and patients are fatigued and possibly deconditioned, we want to provide interventions that can help them to improve their quality of life. And usually we're trying to do that by reducing patients fatigue and increasing their functional capacity by prescribing physical activity. Um, and when we talk about physical activity, often we use the terms physical activity and exercise interchangeably. But physical activity is just a broader term. It can incorporate lots of different areas like a person's occupation, how they um, get around every day, the transport they take, what recreational sports they do and their household chores. And exercise is just a subtype of physical activity that's planned and, and structured and repetitive and has a specific purpose in maintaining fitness. So physical activity often includes exercise and that we see both terms used in the literature. And physical activity and exercise studies in oncology, really um, the number of trials that we see is really increasing very, very rapidly. This study here just shows a review in lung cancer. So this is the studies completed um, up to the end of 2019 and the cumulative number of clinical trials, which are indicated in blue and systematic reviews, which are indicated in orange, increases year on year. So this changing landscape is really beneficial because now we're seeing the benefits of exercise emerging quite strongly. And this was summarized by an international group in 2019 and they examined the benefits associated with exercise for all patients with cancer. So this isn't specifically patients with advanced cancer. Um, and they found that with all of the studies to that point, there was strong evidence for improvements in health related quality of life, in fatigue, in lymphedema, physical function and symptoms of anxiety and depression. So we can say that for any patient with cancer who engages in physical activity, they will experience um, the benefits in, in some of these domains. What we're also finding out now as the evidence gets stronger is the exact prescription we need to provide to patients. So the amount of exercise and the type of exercise. For example, we know that to improve patients' health related quality of life, we should prescribe a combination of exercise that gets the patient's heart rate up and exercise that makes their muscles strong. Whereas for fatigue, patients seem to benefit more from exercise that gets their heart rate up and their body moving, as opposed to the type of exercise that gets their muscles stronger. And like I said, this was in a general cancer population. The advanced cancer um, in particular, the most recent review was in 2018 by Haywood, and he found very similar findings to what's listed here. He found similar benefits for these outcomes. But he also found additional benefits in two further outcomes, and they were sleep. So improved sleep quality was associated with physical, greater physical activity levels and improved body composition was also found to be associated with increased physical activity levels in advanced patients living with advanced cancer. So we have reviews now that are emerging in cancer, in advanced cancer specifically, and also in some groups of patients with advanced cancer. And one of those subgroups is patients who are living with bone mets. So as well as establishing the efficacy of these trials um, in terms of exercise behavior, aerobic fitness, muscle strength, walking speed and muscle mass, all important components of a person's function, which we know is associated with their quality of life. These um, studies have also been very, very um, positive in terms of how acceptable the exercise interventions were for patients, how well they tolerated them, and how well they were able to adhere to the programs in terms of missed sessions and um, able, being able to complete programs. That seems to be um, quite manageable for patients. And it also showed that um, there aren't isn't an association between physical activity and adverse events, and symptoms are not aggravated 
with exercise interventions. So emerging evidence um, that seems to support the role of physical activity for patients with bone mets and further work is underway in terms of the, the um, effectiveness and some of those that emerging evidence listed there on the left. Another subgroup that there's stronger evidence um, that has been analysed for is lung cancer. So there was a Cochrane review in 2019 specifically for patients with advanced cancer. And they found that exercise can improve or avoid the decline in exercise capacity and disease specific global health related quality of life for these patients. However, there was no significant effects found for physical activity in terms of dyspnea, fatigue, anxiety and depression and lung function. This was um, a Cochrane review and they did highlight that these fi findings should be cautioned um, interpreted with caution because of the low number of studies that have been completed in, in advanced lung cancer and um, the small sample sizes in the studies that do exist. But it does give us an idea of where the evidence, um, what in, in interventions the evidence supports. So what we're trying to do here is intervene with physical activity interventions before a patient reaches the point where they are deconditioned or slip into disability. And I suppose what we're doing then is giving them the exercise information, guidance and advice to increase their physical activity levels and optimise their physical function. Um, and because we are trying to intervene with that information, we'll talk about it a little bit more now. So the exact um, guidance on exercise prescription uh, I'll discuss here. So we know that there are guidelines for any patient diagnosed with cancer um, and they are set out by the American College of Sports Medicine. So they advise that for any patient, they're advised to do aerobic exercise three times a week, somewhere from 30 to 60 minutes of moderate intensity exercise. And we'll talk about that a little bit more now. If they can, they're also advised to do strength exercises twice a week and um, two sets of 8 to 15 reps at 60% of 1RM, which is one repetition max, the maximum uh, weight that a person can lift. So these guidelines, um, they, while they exist for the general cancer population, they may or may not be suitable for the patients that we see every day. So they may be a world away from where some patients are in terms of their physical function. Um, but there are other patients living with advanced cancer who may be able to achieve these guidelines. So it's up to the exercise professional to interpret where the patient is at, assess them properly, and see how appropriate these guidelines are to give to patients. They do also state that the, the message that should be delivered to patients is that they should avoid inactivity. So if patients um, really, if these goals are out of reach for some patients, the message should be to, to avoid inactivity and be as physically active as possible without going into these specifics. If a patient is asking about the activity guidelines, we are advising moderate intensity aerobic exercise. And this is the exercise that they're supposed to be building up three days a week for between 30 to 60 minutes. And that could be any of the activities listed here. Any body um, movement, I suppose, that gets their heart rate up will be considered aerobic activity. And the moderate intensity that's advised is often the part that patients need more information on. How do they know that they're achieving the right intensity? Well, we tend to use the Borg um, rating, of, rate, rating of perceived exertion scale, and that's a self-report. So patients are educated that they might feel a little bit hot, a little bit sweaty, and a little bit out of breath, or they can be given this scale and asked to go somewhere between you know, somewhat hard and hard, to get their breathing up to that point. There are other ways to gauge exercise intensity. You can use heart rate monitors, for example, but there can be a lot of problems with those. Um, first of all, they may not be accessible to patients. And also we know that patients, for example, are on beta blockers, may not get reliable heart rate results. 
Patients who are on chemotherapy show a lot of heart rate variations when using heart rate monitors. Um, so really the most accessible option and, and the one that's probably suitable to most patients is to monitor their exercise using their breathing and the borg breathless scale is how they'll be advised to do that. In terms of strength, so this was the other type of exercise that patients were uh, should be advised to do. The guidelines say that they should do two sets of 8 to 15 repetitions um, and they should be prescribed that at 60% of their one repetition max. That can be hard. Some patients won't be suitable to do a one repetition max test with because they're lifting heavy loads. They can do repetitions to fatigue. So lifting a weight that with two sets of eight to 15 repetitions, their muscles feel fatigue and they have to take a break within sets. The exercises can be machine weight loaded, but often patients with advanced cancer, it's more suitable to do functional exercises. And those exercises may actually be more similar to what's advised for patients with chronic disease and disabilities by the American College of Sports Medicine. So their guidelines for, for, for chronic disease can be a nice place to look for more specific guidance in this area as well. They prescribe these three exercises. Again, very functional. A sit to stand, they advise eight repetitions of that to begin. Step ups, they advise 10 of those, so 10 on each leg. And arm curls, again, to the point where a patient can lift one to two kg and complete their 15 repetitions. So particularly for patients with advanced cancer, these exercises can be a nice place to um, start a patient and again, to build up the weight or the repetitions uh, for the patient. They're also very accessible in terms of patients completing home exercise programs, and um, that can be very beneficial in terms of patient adherence as well. The other types of exercise that are advised for patients are flexibility exercises and balance exercises. Um, so we do need to consider the patient's range, the patient's range of motion and prescribe flexibility exercises, particularly for patients who may have had a period of inactivity, may be deconditioned and have reduced range, or patients who have had surgery and again may have reduced range as a result of surgery. And balance exercises, particularly for patients who may have had systemic treatments like chemotherapy, any platins, anything that would be associated with maybe peripheral neuropathy and impaired um, sensation they may benefit from um, balance programs. And we're seeing emerging evidence again to support balance retraining for those patients. There are some considerations for any patients who were, were prescribing exercise too. So we know that we will assess any patients that we see closely. We will look at their strength and their fitness. But in addition to that, patients living with advanced cancer may benefit from additional screening. And the two I've mentioned here are in terms of their bone health and their fracture risk. So pre-program screening, we may consider something like the WHO tool, which would help to um, look at the patient's fracture risk and does consider things like hormone therapy as secondary osteoporosis. So that can be considered when they're deciding the risk or the bottom grid, which is Miro's classification which um, again is a risk um, prediction tool, which isn't widely used to look at exercise and fracture risk, but it can be, and it has been used in, in a study with patients with multiple myeloma who were undergoing an exercise study. So patients were screened with Merrill's classification, which is the grid here. Those who had a score above nine were considered at risk of pathological fracture and were referred on for further imaging, possibly prophylactic, prophylactic fixation before they ever underwent an exercise program. So it's been used in that population, um, but it isn't used widely. Again, it's something that could be considered um, to identify those patients who may be suitable to undergo exercise programs or they those who may need further medical input before they do so. In addition, to making, in addition to making sure we have our pre-program screening, um, we've given that a lot of consideration. We also want, also want to make sure that for patients with advanced cancer, as they go through their programs, we are continuously reassessing them and monitoring them. 
As I've mentioned, these patients can present at any stage um, of um, func any functional status. So they could be extremely well and deteriorate quite quickly, or um, they may just have days um, where they have certain treatments um, and their, their condition fluctuates. So continuously reassessing at the start of each um, session, pain levels and fatigue levels can be very important so that we can modify our exercise prescription based on how the patient is feeling that day. And what we might also do in terms of monitoring is, yes, we will monitor the patient, but educate the patient on any signs or symptoms that we want them to report back to us. So that could be um, a sudden increase in shortness of breath, for example, or for patients with bone mets, the example I've given here are some of the, the early warning signs of, of spinal cord compression, that we might educate the patient that we want them to tell us and let us know if they have any of the symptoms listed here, such as referred back pain and um, pain that, that occurs at night, pain that doesn't let up. And that can be um, really useful in terms of monitoring the patient's condition day to day or session to session. And we know that's important, in particular, the um, example given of patients with bone mets, because there is still a lot of concern about these patients um, undertaking exercise programmes. The evidence is emerging, but I suppose in, in clinical practice, there are still a number of unanswered questions in, in terms of prescribing exercise. We know from work that our group has done in the last number of years that both oncology and palliative care clinicians in Ireland and physiotherapists are well aware of the risks um, or the possible um, consequences of um, exercise if it's not prescribed um, appropriately. And we want to make sure that we're addressing all of these concerns by assessing patients um, and being, I suppose, up to date with the evidence that's available. Um, main concerns, I suppose, centre on the aggravation of, of symptom control, which we've seen um, in most recent studies um, uh, hasn't happened, that patients' pain levels have stayed well controlled throughout exercise interventions. And we haven't seen exercise studies that have reported um, Patholog pathological fractures or high rates of skeletal related events associated with the exercise interventions. What we have seen in the recent years is more guidance in this area. So um, I worked with a group over in the UK for Macmillan to form exercise guidelines for metastatic bone disease. And many of you may be aware of these, but just to highlight the key messages um, that these guidelines advise, one is that physical activity should be um, prescribed or advised for patients within the capabilities of the person. Um, that's what is advised, so that's the message we should give, be giving patients. And although we should be advising patients around the benefits of physical activity and encouraging them to be active, we should also give them um, the education that I've just described for how to monitor their own signs and symptoms. And that document's available online if anybody wants to look at it for more guidance. How does this work in practice then? I've just pulled one study um, that included patients with advanced cancer in an exercise program. And to my knowledge, this is still the biggest study in this area. So it was completed in 2011 in Norway and included patients with advanced cancer. And this is how they defined advanced cancer. They defined it as incurable and metastatic cancer with a life expectancy of between three months and two years. They also wanted patients to have a Kronofsky performance status score of over 60. So this um, study recruited 231 patients and they were divided into a usual care group and a physical um, exercise group. And the physical exercise group underwent twice weekly exercise sessions for eight weeks. To just highlight the, I suppose, the types of patients that were involved, they were from a number of different primary tumour groups, but they did have a high burden of metastatic disease. So over 90% of the participants in this study had at least one solitary met. And the patients were on a lot of different ongoing treatments. The most common ongoing treatment was chemotherapy. 
So this gives an idea of the exercises um, that were included in the exercise arm of the trial. So there were six exercises. The patients did each exercise for two minutes and they then had a one minute break and progressed on to the next exercise. So there was a step up, there was a bike station, there was an upper limb strengthening station, a trampoline station, which focused on balance retraining, a sit to stand station and a station with a stand to lie movement component. And these, these exercises mimic a lot of the exercises advised by the American College of Sports Medicine guidance, and they're all quite functional. So they focus on movements the patient would have to do day to day. And the emphasis was really on the patient's activities of daily living. So keeping the patients moving through their activity day, activities of daily living as well as possible. There was two outcomes for the study. The primary outcome was physical fatigue, and that was measured with a questionnaire. And the secondary outcome was the patient's physical performance. And that was measured with a shuttle walk test and a hand grip strength test. So there was similar dropout in both groups, um, by 25% for both groups, and that was explained. Um, the most common factor was disease progression. In terms of the outcomes for the primary outcome, there was no significant between group effects for the, for the um, primary outcome of physical fatigue. But there were clinically and statistically significant between group effects found for the shuttle walk test and the hand grip strength test after the intervention. So really, I suppose this type of an exercise intervention, an eight week um, circuit training was found to um, improve the physical capacity of cancer patients. Um, so it gives us an idea of the types of exercise that may be suitable and uh, suitable for our patients. There are some special considerations to give when we're thinking about which of these exercises would be most appropriate for patients. We want to think about the treatment side effects that the patient um, may be experiencing. So possibly the patient had um, treatments that may result in peripheral neuropathy. They may be safer, safer, if, for example, to, uh, completing their exercise on a bike as opposed to a treadmill. Similarly, their activity levels. We need to consider how active they were before their cancer diagnosis or before their cancer treatment because that will have an effect on their baseline, um, on their fitness levels when they're going into a new exercise program. And it may also affect the goals that the patient has. So what do they want to do? What do they want to achieve with their physical activity program? Um, and we wanna make sure that we have a good idea of, I suppose, the goal for the, for the program or the exercise that we prescribe. And then also bone health. So we've mentioned things like bone mets. We need to think about osteoporosis. And we need to think about how we can prescribe the exercise optimally to patients with bone mets. Um, one example of exercise prescription that's put forward is by an Australian group. So this would be the most, I suppose, structured approach to prescribing exercise. And they would say that if the patient has bone mets, that you don't load the area of the body where the bone mets um, are, that you would focus on other areas of the body. So for example, if it's weight training, so the resistance exercise and the patient has bone mets in their upper limbs, that you would focus their strength training or their resistance training on their lower limbs. So um, they've done that for resistance or strength training, aerobic training and flexibility exercises and given quite good guidance um, on how we could approach each of those areas of the body. And they also have guidance if the patient has multiple areas of bone mets about how we might prescribe exercise to that patient. This um, approach has been validated so far in small groups of patients, um, but it is the basis for exercise prescription in larger trials, which I'll talk about later. The most important thing when we're advising patients is to uh, make sure that they're comfortable. So we would always say to patients, comfort is key. Um, we would try to explain to them that they should recognize the difference between soreness and pain. So if patients haven't been active, um, they may experience muscle soreness that's very normal for, for someone who undertakes an exercise session or starts an exercise program. But we want them to be aware of those signs of bone pain that we talked about when we were, we were talking about educating the patient. Because we know for patients with bone mets that pain um, is associated with risk of fracture. 
particularly pain that um, occurs on physical function with physical function. So pain associated with getting out of bed, with standing up from a chair, that pain in particular we want to pay attention to um, and we want patients to report to us. We have taken this approach with our studies, so studies we've completed in Trinity. Um, we've had patients come through a randomised control trial called EXPECT, they all had metastatic prostate cancer and they um, were prescribed exercise how I've, I've, I've described today. We learned a lot from them. So a lot of this um, is kind of a way to address patients' uncertainty. So a lot of these patients, when they found out they had um, bone mets and were on some of their treatments, they weren't sure if they should exercise. Um, and then the other part is trying to get patients back into the cycle of being physically active um, and it helping them to identify what symptoms were okay to exercise with and what symptoms may have benefited from further medical attention. So we have a group of international experts that are looking specifically at bone mets and they will um, be bringing out more evidence in future and more guidance specifically for patients with bone metastases in terms of exercise prescription. But they did have an abstract at ASCO last year look um, on the evidence that they've collected so far. Um, and their key points so far on um, the evidence that, or the, on the information they've gathered from exercise professionals working with patients with bone mets is that exercise professionals seek medical guidance before um, starting a structured exercise um, for, for, for people with bone mets. So that is that exercise professionals seek further information on the patients before they prescribe them exercise. Um, most commonly, exercise professionals will go to a medical oncologist or radiation oncologist for medical guidance and the type of information that we're going to be looking for are the, inf the number, the location, the type of the bone lesion that the patient has, the level of bone pain and any other symptoms that we should know about. So they, um, from, from talking to experts in um, the US and Canada, have this is the approach that has been taken so far. And if patients are looking for further information, sometimes it's difficult. There is physical activity information on um, the Irish Cancer Society website, on the Macmillan website. They've moved more campaign with a lot of information, but it doesn't address pa uh, patients with living with advanced cancer in, in particular. So the Penn State College of Medicine Exercise Oncology website have a section specifically on exercise for advanced cancers. And if patients are looking for information, they may find that useful. So to summarize what we've talked about today, I guess the main message is that physical activity is very important for anyone with a cancer diagnosis, and that includes patients with advanced cancer. Physical activity is considered safe for patients with advanced cancer, including patients with bone mets, but patients would benefit from an assessment by an exercise specialist to determine the optimal prescription for the patient. Um, and the main message, I suppose, if we're talking to patients tomorrow, is that they should avoid inactivity and be as active as comfortable. From a research point of view, there are a lot of things we still don't know. We do need larger, high quality randomized control trials to confirm and expand on the knowledge we have, particularly in relation to the dosage. So what frequency and intensity of exercise is the optimal um, intensity for, of exercise for patients with advanced cancer? And also the effects of exercise training. What other outcomes may be affected by exercise prescription for these patients? In terms of internationally, what's happening with the research, this is probably where we're, we're turning our attention now is to see what happens with the November GAP4 trial. That is the largest ongoing trial of patients with metastatic prostate cancer. Um, and the aim of this trial is to evaluate the impact of high intensity aerobic and resistance training on survival and quality of life in advanced, these advanced prostate cancer patients. It is quite a rigorous training protocol. These patients present for multiple exercise sessions every week over a two year period. The trial aims to recruit a total of 866 men um, and there is that follow up period because the over, overall survival is the primary outcome. It's recruiting at the moment. There are over 100 patients um, recruited to the trial so far. 
So I think this trial, the, the, the outcomes from this trial will be what we look at and um, we really look to in future. Some of those secondary outcomes include uh, quality of life, pain um, and a lot of metabolic endpoints that will, I suppose, be very important to try and understand not only what are the benefits of exercise, but what are the biological mechanisms underpinning some of those outcomes. Um, so we need to, yeah, we need to keep an eye on this. Our group, we are also doing a, a trial looking at a longitudinal study looking at the association between physical activity and skeletal related events. So we have um, funding from the All-Ireland All Institute of Hospice and Palliative Care and the Irish Cancer Society to follow patients over a year um, and look at any associations between their activity levels and those um, skeletal related events. So if you want any more information on that study or any of the studies our group are involved with, we have a web page, the, the link is there. Um, and our exercise oncology email address is there if you wanted to get in touch with us for, for any reason. So thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my email address is here. If anyone has any questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch.